The following might sound like comedy, but it's 100% real history. In the midst of the Protestant Reformation, a group of devout Catholics gathered, and they formed the Society of Jesus, known as the Jesuits, in 1540. Their aim? To revive Catholicism in Europe and spread Christianity around the world. China was one of their targets. They wanted to spread Christianity to this ancient empire. But there was a problem. China did not welcome foreigners, and the Chinese authorities restricted the movements of foreigners into the country. After many years of failures, they finally found a strategy to solve this. In 1613, the head of the Jesuit China mission, Niccolo Longobardo, sent his confrere, Nicola Trigal, to Europe to recruit new Jesuits skilled in astronomy and mathematics. When Trigal returned to China, he brought with him a number of outstanding mathematicians and scientists, including the German Johann Adam Schall von Bell, the Bohemian Wenceslaus Pantaleon Kierwitzer, and the Swiss Johannes Schreck. Schreck in particular was a friend of Galileo, and would later have correspondence with Kepler. They were tasked to implement a strategy pioneered by the senior Italian confrere Matteo Ricci, who was the first European that managed to enter the forbidden city of Beijing in 1601. Using his knowledge of advanced Western science, Ricci had packaged himself as a erudite Western scholar of great knowledge, impressing Chinese officials with his knowledge of astronomy and mathematics. Through this, he won fame and legitimacy for the missionaries. He would entertain and gain the trust of Chinese officials and literati with Western gadgets like globes, prisms, clocks and oil paintings, as well as with his advanced Western scientific knowledge by predicting eclipses and demonstrating that the sun is larger than the earth and the moon smaller. With his newfound fame as an erudite scholar, he was eventually invited by the Chinese emperor himself into the forbidden city to become an advisor to the emperor, who sought his services in matters related to astronomy and science. The emperor and Chinese officials felt that the Chinese calendar was in need of reform, since it was increasingly showing its defects. In order to test the merits of the missionaries' learning, the Chinese government organized a competition in 1629. The missionaries and Chinese scholars employing traditional methods were each asked to make predictions for the solar eclipse expected the next day. The Chinese scholars predicted that it would start at 10.30 and end at 12.30, lasting two hours. But the Christian missionaries had a very powerful book that the Chinese heathens did not have. The astronomical tables compiled by Copernicus and Reinhold. The eclipse occurred at 11.30 and lasted only two minutes just as the missionaries predicted. In the following years, further tests were conducted on predicting the positions of Saturn, Venus, Mercury, Mars and Jupiter, as well as the timing of solar and lunar eclipses. In every case, the missionaries' predictions proved more accurate. The emperor thus put the missionaries and their Chinese allies in charge of compiling a new Chinese calendar. The new calendar the Jesuits created for China is known as the Chongzhen calendar and became the official calendar of China. But you see, the Chinese were not really interested in science the same way we are nowadays. The reason they were interested in knowing the timing and positions of astronomical phenomena is because they believed that astronomical phenomena like eclipses and meteors would define signals about the world's fortune. The Chinese believed that there were lucky and unlucky days 
for everything, from when to have a wedding or funeral to when not to take a bath. And thus they believed that a good calendar is essential to ensure their good fortune. In a sudden twist of events, darkness was to be for the missionaries. Two members of the royal family died within a few months after a funeral for another member of the royal family. The missionaries were accused by some Chinese of causing their deaths via their new calendar. Evidently, the royal burial was conducted on an inauspicious day and thus caused the two royal deaths, which must be due to the missionaries' new calendar being incorrect. The Jesuits were accused and judged guilty of plotting to subvert and destroy China. Xiao von Bell and his accomplices were sentenced to death. A normal execution was seen to be too lenient, and they were sentenced to what the Chinese called Lin Zi, death by slow slicing, their body to be slowly cut up into small pieces while they were still alive, for them to suffer the most slow and painful death. Other Jesuits less involved in the calendar making were sentenced to be beaten up with bamboo and then exiled. But then, just as the sentence was being pronounced, a comet appeared in the sky, and later an earthquake struck the capital, splitting one of the walls of the imperial palace. The Chinese thought this must be heaven showing its displeasure towards the sentence, that they must have made a mistake. So the missionaries were pardoned. After some time, the missionaries were restored to their former position, and the new calendar once again became the official calendar of China, and by extension also the calendar of Vietnam and Korea. In fact, the Chinese calendar in use today is still essentially based on the calendar devised by the Jesuit missionaries in the 17th century. Indeed, even now in the 21st century, the exact day on which the Chinese New Year, or more generally the Lunar New Year including the Vietnamese and Korean New Year, will happen next year is in fact derived from rules devised by Western missionaries hundreds of years ago with only minor modifications. The Jesuits' achievements were not limited to merely reforming the Chinese calendar, however. They compiled the first known European Chinese dictionary in history. Michele Ruggeri, one of the very first pioneering Jesuit missionaries who went into China, had to learn Mandarin Chinese as an adult without the existence of any interpreter or dictionaries. Imagine how hard that is. Apart from their knowledge of science, it was in fact their linguistic abilities, being able to converse with the Chinese in Chinese, that enabled them to gain the trust and respect of the Chinese and which enabled them to penetrate China. The Jesuits were the first in history to translate Chinese classics and philosophy, like the four books and five classics, into European languages and publish them in Europe. On the flip side, the Jesuit missionaries were also the first in history to translate important Western scientific and philosophical work into Chinese, from classics like Euclid's Elements and the works of Aristotle, to the then latest cutting-edge science by Galileo and Kepler. The Jesuits were the first to translate and make these works available in Chinese. As early as 1628, Johannes Schreck had written a book in Chinese where he detailed how Galileo deduced that Venus revolve around the Sun, how the changing shape of light from Venus is actually reflected light from the Sun, like the different phases of the Moon from Crescent to Gibbous, and how that changing shape differs from the Moon in a way that proves Venus actually revolves around the Sun rather than Earth. But perhaps because of Galileo's conflict with the Catholic Church, Schreck didn't name Galileo explicitly, and just referred to him as a celebrated mathematician. You know who. Or maybe we are reading too much into something unintentional. Indeed, 
the Jesuit did not try to keep their scientific methods a secret from the Chinese, in part because they believed that those who were able to understand and appreciate Western science and philosophy were also more likely to appreciate their Western religious message. Not only did they translate works of Western science into Chinese, they even proposed to the Chinese emperor to incorporate Western philosophy and logic into the curriculum of the Chinese imperial examination so that it could be widely learned by Chinese students and literati. But the Chinese emperor rejected the proposal. Had the emperor decided differently, perhaps China wouldn't have found itself so hopelessly behind Europe in science and technology when European countries knocked on China's door later in the 19th century. It also didn't help that Chinese scholars and literati blinded themselves with pride and arrogance. China had historically been for a long time the most advanced country in East Asia. It saw itself as the best and was accustomed to seeing everyone else as barbarians. Now faced with the demonstrable superiority of Jesuit Western science that threatened to challenge their Chinese pride, Chinese scholars and literati decided to subscribe themselves to a self-comforting theory that Western knowledge actually originated in ancient China. The theory that the advanced Western knowledge was actually ancient Chinese knowledge that was imported to the West, but subsequently lost in China itself, and only now being re-imported back to China. This created superficial acceptance of Western knowledge legitimizing its use in, for example, the Chinese calendar, since this knowledge was supposedly Chinese after all, but it prevented real understanding of Western science as Chinese scholars and literati devoted themselves to scouring and studying ancient Chinese texts to search for supposedly lost Chinese knowledge rather than try to study and understand Western knowledge from its true source. It was not until the late 19th century that reality became so stark that Chinese intellectuals would finally be shaken awake from this self-comforting delusion. But that is another story. If you think science and the calendar were all the Jesuit did in China, no. The emperor also got them to make cannons for the Chinese army and to advise on military matters as the Chinese discovered the power of Western weapons. You know, whatever it takes to spread the gospel and save souls. They wrote books on the science of ballistics, and the cannons they made were used in various internal and external wars, including to defeat the Russian army in the 1680s. Furthermore, the Jesuit worked as map makers and artists, they used their Western geography and cartography skills to survey and design maps of China and beyond for the Chinese government, and used their artistic skills to draw portraits of imperial figures and paint scenes of battles and events for the imperial court. The Jesuits also served as architects and engineers. You need a very particular set of skills to be a missionary in China. Notwithstanding the aforementioned brief interruption that almost got them killed, as the most advanced scientist in China, Johann Adam Schall von Bell and his successor Ferdinand Verbiest were appointed by successive Chinese emperors as the head of the Bureau of Mathematics and Astronomy in the imperial government, an important post which made them powerful officials in the imperial court. Their presence at the center of power of China, close to the emperor, gave the Jesuits an invaluable position from which to try and convert China to Christianity. The Jesuit strategy, however, was not one counting on converting China from the top. It would have been almost impossible to convert the emperor or government officials, and the Jesuit knew this. Monogamy is required of Christians. But unlike today, China was not traditionally a monogamous society. Men would allow multiple wives or legal concubines. But of course, not all men could have multiple wives. That was the reserve of the rich and powerful like government officials and the royal family. 
the average and the poor were left with just one or no wife. Such is one reason why there was little realistic prospect of converting many high government officials and much more viability converting the average and the poor. Yet there's a good reason why the Jesuits spent all those efforts securing high positions in the Chinese government via science. The fame and power of the Jesuit scientists in the capital was essential for protecting their more religious-minded colleagues in the provinces who were proselytizing the common people. For example, in the early days of the mission, when Niccolo Longobardo got in trouble with a city magistrate in Shaozhou in 1605, he mentioned his contacts with Ricci to a visiting provincial official. Since this superior official had heard of Ricci and knew how he had been received at court, he ordered the local magistrate to drop his case against the missionary. And later in 1691, when the Jesuits and their Christian converts were harassed by local officials in Hangzhou, the missionaries there turned to their colleagues at court to seek imperial intervention. Acting on his high regard for the Jesuit service to him, the emperor ordered the local officials to end the persecution. The success of the Jesuit scientists in the capital had brought the Jesuit missionaries relative safety in China, in contrast to the Catholic mission in Japan, where many missionaries were martyred in a series of persecutions. But there was also a downside to this safety. The Jesuit constantly had a shortage of missionaries in China, as young Jesuit recruits choose instead to go to Japan. As it turned out, to many of the zealous young Jesuits in Europe who petitioned to become missionaries, the chance to be martyred was not a deterrent, but rather it was an attraction. The safety of the China mission was in their eyes much less appealing than grim tales of dying for the faith in Japan. Yet even those who were not deliberately seeking to be martyred were probably just as brave, if not as crazy, to our modern eye. Sailing from Europe to China in the 17th century, having to sail around Africa, was a long and perilous journey that took many months. Even if one did not shipwreck, Scurvy and various diseases resulting from malnutrition and the rough, cramped conditions on board claimed the lives of many. Estimates vary, but as much as half of the Jesuits, almost certainly a double-digit percentage, who embarked from Europe died en route in the journey before ever reaching China. Life in the 17th century was quite hard in general, yet the likes of Xiao von Bell, who was born to a noble family, probably could have chosen a safer, more comfortable, or at least a more lucrative career instead. That they didn't is perhaps the power of religion. The Jesuit shortage of manpower in China was nevertheless still not a fatal problem. However, just as the Jesuit quest to spread Christianity in China for God was finally getting on track despite everything, there came an enemy. Their rival Catholic orders, the Franciscans and the Dominicans, both so-called mendicant orders. Their arrival in China was news the Jesuits dreaded. The Jesuits saw the mendicants' track record in East Asia as a series of calamities and helped these imprudent mendicant friars responsible for the catastrophic failure of the Catholic mission in Japan. They were bursting to enter and do here what they had done in Japan, wrote the Jesuit Alfonso Vagnone. Their fears were further confirmed when an anti-Christian incident in the coastal city of Fu'an involving officials and mendicant friars occurred. The Jesuit had spent decades carefully building up and cultivating a good reputation and good public image for both themselves and the Christian religion in China, and they feared the mendicants might put all their efforts in jeopardy. It was not merely their reputation as respectable scholar-scientists at court, 
One important reason the Jesuits were able to earn the trust and respect of so many Chinese and have the success they had thus far was that they respected and accommodated the local Chinese customs and traditions. Not only did they speak Chinese and dress in Chinese clothing, but moreover, they all read and studied Chinese Confucian classics to gain an understanding of Chinese culture. It was a common custom in China for people to participate in Confucian ceremonies and to keep tablets with their ancestors' names in their homes. The Jesuits respected this fact and saw it as merely a secular custom where people remember and show respect to their ancestors and the great philosopher Confucius. Thus the Jesuits were horrified when they learned that mendicant friars were roaming the streets of Beijing, preaching that the emperor was wrong and that Confucius was in hell. In order to make the friars disappear unnoticed from the capital, the Jesuit enlisted the aid of two allied Chinese officials. Acting like angry officials, the pair went to the friars' lodging to inform them that their petition had been denied and that they had to be deported. The ruse worked. The Franciscan did not return to northern China for over a decade. And in the south of China, when a Franciscan tried to head inland from the coast, the Jesuit arranged for him to be kidnapped by a team of Chinese Christians and Jesuit domestic servants. These tricks worked for a while, but eventually the Jesuits weren't able to prevent the mendicants from penetrating China. The mendicants viewed the practice of the Jesuits with contempt. To the mendicants, the Chinese culture of Confucianism and ancestor veneration was superstitious religious idolatry that could not be tolerated, and the Jesuits' permissive attitude towards them amount to no less than a betting paganism. Seeing the Jesuits' missionary practice in China, the mendicants filed reports of their findings to Catholic authorities in Europe with the aim of bringing their missionary rifles the Jesuits to heal. This kick-started what is known in history as the Chinese Rites Controversy. What followed was 70 years of intense debate within Europe's Catholic circles, with both sides exchanging volumes upon volumes of heated polemics. In the end, the Roman Inquisition decided against the Jesuits, and Pope Clement XI ordered the Chinese rites in question to be banned in 1704, not allowing them to be practiced by any Catholics. In order to circumvent any Jesuit resistance or non-cooperation and bring the Chinese church in line, the Pope sent a legate directly to the Chinese emperor. Upon hearing the demands and seeing the legate's uncompromising attitude, the Chinese emperor was greatly enraged and ordered not only for the legate to be expelled, but also for the Christian religion to be restricted throughout his empire, stopping just short of completely banning Christianity, but twice later almost deciding on it. Hanging by a thread, the mission half in ruin, the Jesuits spent the next few years trying to get the papacy to reverse his decision. Amid the gloom, there came a sudden twist of joy when a member of the Chinese royal house converted to Christianity. But unfortunately for the Jesuits, the papacy sent in yet another legate with the very same demands as before and the royal who converted was to be implicated in a dynastic power struggle as he belonged to a branch of the imperial family considered rival by the future emperor. In the end, the new emperor went on to completely ban Christianity in 1724, ordering the closure of all Christian churches in the empire and the expulsion of all missionaries apart from the Jesuit scientists and artists in court working directly for the emperor, whom he kept in service for several more decades. And thus, the Jesuits' 140-year-long effort had been reduced to naught. But as the emperor himself told the Jesuits, 
they were lucky to be expelled alive, remarking that he had ordered the destruction of many Buddhist temples and had over a thousand lamas killed. Bear in mind that as an autocratic ruler, Chinese emperors often brutally suppress religious sects seen as threatening the authority of the emperor or upsetting the established order, regardless of whether they were indigenous or foreign. A small number of Jesuit missionaries did manage to remain in the provinces for a number of years after the expulsion order, either in secret or citing old age as extenuating circumstances against moving before they eventually dwindled to insignificance. Some Dominicans who attempted to stay in secret or sneak back into China were not so lucky, however. They were tortured and executed, including Friar Peter Sands, who was later declared a saint by the Catholic Church for his martyrdom and service to the Church. In 1939, the papacy finally reversed its decision on the Chinese rights, but after two centuries, this came a little bit too late for those long-dead Jesuits in our story. Nevertheless, the Jesuits as an organization still exist today, and even in the 21st century, they are still making interesting new stories. Here are the three main sources I've consulted in making this video. If you are interested in learning more about this episode of history, go get these books. I almost didn't make this video. All the work needed to make this notwithstanding, cartoon illustrations seem to me necessary to tell this interesting story most effectively. But trained as an academic mathematician, not an artist, the task of drawing all the cartoon illustrations for this video seemed so daunting, and I doubted whether I had the necessary artistic abilities to do it. After much dithering, I finally took the plunge and gave it a go. Apart from some teenage art almost a decade ago, this was my first time attempting to draw as an adult. You can probably tell which illustrations I drew first and which ones I drew last as my skill improved towards the end. Despite my initial doubts about my artistic abilities, they seem to turn out alright. Hope it managed to give you some joy as well as knowledge. Let me know if I have succeeded. All in all, this video took me months of effort to make virtually single-handedly. If you enjoyed this video, please like, comment, subscribe, and if you feel like it, consider leaving me a tip to support me and my work. Whether you do or not, however small or large, thank you very much.